Namaskaram. In the last class, we were introduced to the idea and the importance of a quantity like the rate of change of a quantity like y with respect to another quantity x. And then we saw that for a straight line graph, right? If the graph is a straight line, that means what? That means that when you start from one point and you keep going in the same direction, when you keep going in the same direction, you hit all the other points resulting in a straight line. This can only happen when you start from one point and you keep moving in the same direction and you hit all the other points. That can only happen when the rate of change of y with respect to x as you go from one point to the next point, the next point to the next point, the next point to the next point, that rate of change has to be constant. When that rate of change is constant, this results in going in the same direction to hit all the points and the result of that is all the points form one straight line. Therefore, we can say very easily that next time whenever I see a straight line graph, that automatically means that for any two points on that straight line graph, we can rest assured that the rate of change of y with respect to x will be constant, it will be fixed and it will have one particular value for any two points on that particular straight line. This we can say without a shadow of a doubt. Then what did we do in the last class? We use the idea of constant rate of change for a straight line graph to then prove that for an experiment like what we had, that is a car moving on a straight road with a fixed speed, you get an equation describing this experiment which is of this form. In this case, that equation is y equal to 5x. It has this form. When you plot the graph of this equation, the kind of graph that you get will definitely be a straight line like this. And to prove that the graph is a straight line, we were able to use our idea, our understanding of constant rate of change for a straight line. And what does it really mean to say that this line is the graph of this equation? What it means to say that this line is the graph of this equation is that for any point on this line, if the point is on that line, it means for sure that the point's y coordinate, like for example this point, the point's y coordinate will be 5 times the point's x coordinate. In other words, all the points on this line, they satisfy or they obey this equation y equal to 5x. That's what it means to say that this line is the graph of this equation. All the points obey this equation. And since all the points obey this equation, this equation is the story of this experiment. Therefore, it means that all the points on this line, they are basically showing you all the individual stages in the original experiment. Now for some interesting terminology. So here again, we have our same equation y equal to 5x, which we've been calling an equation till now, and there's no problem. But now we know that when we plot the graph of this equation y equal to 5x, the graph is a straight line. It's a straight line graph for an equation which looks like this. And the fancy word for the word line, basically I want to say straight line, but a fancy way of saying straight line in mathematics is we use the word linear. Right? And you can see the connection, right? Linear comes from the word line. So whenever you see the word linear, you are thinking of a line. You're thinking of a straight line. And therefore, since an equation in this form, y equal to 5x, has a straight line graph, we can now say an equation of this form, y equal to 5x is in this example, its graph is a linear graph a straight line graph or a linear graph and therefore we can now add more color, more description. Instead of only calling this an equation, we can now call this sort of an equation, we can call it a linear equation. So therefore we can say that any equation which looks like this, which has this format, its graph will definitely be a straight line and therefore equations which are in this form, we can now refer to them as linear equations. Let's now do some abstraction. 
if you recall what abstraction was we always want to use what information we have discovered and see that information in a bigger way from a like a bird's eye view way so that we can then apply the basic idea to different similar situations even if the actual measurements the actual numbers may be different but since the idea is the same if they're fitting a same broad pattern we can apply that pattern to different situations knowing that the individual situations are just different versions different cases of the same idea so this is the use of the idea of abstraction so let's see how we can abstract our original equation y equal to 5x into getting a more general form a general pattern of how a linear equation looks so let's start from our actual equation our actual equation for this particular experiment is y equal to 5x now let's look at each term in the equation and see what role each of those terms are actually playing in this experiment and in this equation the quantity represented by the letter y is in this particular experiment it is the distance traveled by the car and that in our experiment is playing the role of dependent variable we have seen these individual terms in the first lesson dependent variables independent variables constants and control variables right so i'm just you know calling back to that so in our experiment the distance traveled represented by y is nothing but the dependent variable then the term five right is playing the role of the constant the fixed value who's which is basically a number we know the value it's fixed right the term 5 is playing that role so it's playing the role of constant and in this particular experiment the value of that constant is 5 and what does the 5 mean in this experiment it tells us the speed of the car along the road in this experiment that's what 5 represents and the value of the speed is 5 okay that's playing the role of constant and the term x in this experiment is playing the role of the independent variable and that x that quantity in this experiment is the passing time right and we saw why we gave these words right of course 5 we know is a constant that's why we call it constant uh, in this format the reason we call x the independent variable was because in this format generally what you do is you know x you know the amount of time that has passed you plug in x multiply by 5 and you get how much distance the car has traveled which is y so y is got by after plugging in x so in many ways the distance y depends upon what you plug in for x hence we refer to x as the independent variable 5 being the constant value of speed is the constant a number in this case the value is 5 and y is the dependent variable in this experiment it is the distance traveled by the car so this equation fits a larger pattern the larger pattern is dependent variable is equal to some constant some known number into independent variable this is just a specific case of this larger pattern right and we know that when you have an equation like this because of the full analysis we did for this equation we actually took the points and we plotted it and we did that whole analysis we know that an equation like this when you plot it the graph is a straight line linear therefore an equation like this is referred to as a linear equation right now we are saying the same thing in a bigger way an equation like this the general form is what the general form is this dependent variable is equal to constant into independent variable so now we can say the same thing in a bigger way if i have any equation which is in this form any equation which is in this form dependent variable is constant into independent variable it is just a different version of this equation right and therefore whatever treatment that applied to this equation however we took this equation and plotted it and got the graph the same thing will apply to whatever other equation i have as long as it fits this format because if it fits this format it will just be a different version of this equation and therefore the same plotting process will happen that equation will also give me a straight line and therefore it since it fits this equation format that equation can also be referred to as a linear equation because it will also give you a straight line so this is a general form of a linear equation so what actually happens is if you do another experiment maybe in the other experiment 
what quantity is playing the role of dependent variable that is what quantity is playing the role of y it could be different based on what experiment you are doing it need not be a car moving on the road it could be some experiment in light or some experiment in electricity something in the field of biology or chemistry whatever right but it fits the same picture so maybe in that experiment what quantity is playing the role of dependent variable need not be distance it could be something else what quantity is playing the role of constant need not be speed right it could be something else in that experiment and its value need not be 5 right but it should be constant it should be some number right it could be 10 it could be 33 it could be 0 0.5 it could be something but it's a fixed number right and it need not be speed of a car it could be something else some other quantity based on what experiment you are doing but it still fits the pattern of being a constant value a fixed number right and similarly what quantity is playing the role of independent variable in your other experiment it could be anything else right it could be electrical current it could be voltage or whatever based on what experiment you are doing right but it is playing the role of independent variable and it's still fitting this format right so in that experiment when you actually take that equation the equation is going to be similar to this in format but the actual quantities may be different right it could be y equal to 2.5x where y is not distance x is not time it could be something else but it's a different version of the same kind of equation in the form dependent variable is constant into independent variable so for that equation also when you actually plot the graph the procedure you follow will be the same the same treatment we did we could do for that also and therefore for that equation also we'll get a straight line maybe we won't get a line like this right maybe we'll get a line like this maybe we'll get a line like this but the basic process is the same so it will still be a straight line albeit a different straight line albeit albeit figure it out a different straight line but a straight line nonetheless so using this as an example we are now able to see that it's part of a general picture a general format of a linear equation which is in this form right so any equation which is in this form Right? This being just one example of that, if the equation is in this form, using this as a guide, we know that if I do the entire plotting for an equation in this form, this entire procedure will only be repeated in one way or the other and I will get a straight line. It may not be this exact straight line. It may be a line like this or like that, but it will be a straight line. So any equation of this form will give you a straight line. And therefore, this is a good way of saying the general form of a linear equation. Any equation in this form will be a linear equation. Its graph will be a straight line. What exact straight line is it going to be? How exactly will the straight line look? That will vary based on what actual experiment you're doing. That is the case by case thing. But all those cases are just different versions of the same general abstraction, the general form of a linear equation. And we'll soon be doing individual cases. Even for the car experiment, we'll vary certain aspects of the experiment and we'll see for the same car experiment, by changing certain parts of the experiment, we can get different types of linear equations. All will be straight lines. All will fit this general format, but the exact line will be different. So we'll show those different cases very soon. But this at least now helps us to take the first step towards getting a general form of a linear equation, which is what we have shown here. This sort of abstraction process is very useful for us in many kinds of scientific investigations as we'll see very soon. Because tomorrow, if I'm doing any experiment in any subject, in any field, and if I get an equation which is fitting this form, right? I get an equation which is fitting the form dependent variable is equal to some constant into the independent variable, whatever they mean in the context of that experiment. As long as they are in this form, I know that in one way or the other, the same graph plotting story will happen, right? Maybe the graph means something different for that experiment, right? But the same story will happen as it happened for our y equal to 5x experiment right and therefore i know that if the equation of that experiment is in this form 
whatever happens its graph will be some sort of a straight line because this is the form of a linear equation right the same story will repeat and therefore the graph will be some straight line it may be a line like this it may be a line like this but whatever it is if the equation is in this form it is in the form of a linear equation which means the graph will be a straight line graph this is of great use to me because then when i see the equation in that form immediately now it's like a mapping it's like a match the following right you see the equation in this form and immediately in your head some sort of a straight line graph picture is immediately forming this is very useful for us and the same thing can happen in reverse and also be of great use to us because in many scientific situations sometimes we may not have the data from the original experiment we may not have the original equation but we may have a situation where we are looking at a graph right when we look at a graph and if the graph is a straight line now we can look at the same thing in reverse the moment i see a straight line graph i know only one sort of equation that is one form of equation will give a straight line graph it is going to be in this form it is going to be in the form of a linear equation this way of going from one to the other and the other back to the first based on what situation you are facing is very useful if you have the equation and you can see what form the equation is and then you can realize how the graph will be and in reverse if you have the graph based on the shape of the graph you can work backwards and get an idea of how the original equation will look this is tremendously useful for us and to give an analogy that's why i've written this over here this is very similar or equivalent right very similar to the concept of fingerprints and this is exactly what we do when the police have to solve crimes and stuff like that right every human being has a unique set of fingerprints right just like every equation form has a unique graph right so what we do if we have the human being we can get his fingerprints just like if i have the equation form i know how the graph looks this can also be used in reverse right tomorrow if something happens as a crime committed or whatever i look at the fingerprints if i have the fingerprints i can trace back that particular set of fingerprints to a particular human being so getting the graph from the equation and then getting the equation from the graph is very similar to how we have a human being giving you fingerprints and then you can then use the fingerprints to find out who gave you those fingerprints you can work backwards right so a good way of realizing this or good way of putting all this into a picture is to say it like this the graph is like the fingerprint of an equation So now that we know that an equation like what we have here y equal to 5x belongs to a general form of equations where we have the dependent variable being equal to some constant some number into the independent variable right and all equations in this form when you actually plot their graphs the graph that you get will always be a straight line graph line or linear therefore all equations which belong to this form we refer to as linear equations and this is one example of a linear equation from our given experiment so now we have completely established that the question that we now ask is what is the easiest way to plot out the line to get that line for a linear equation to get the graph for a linear equation what is the minimum number of points that we need to plot after which we can easily get the line the reason we ask this question is because if you recall the method that we used to get the straight line graph for our equation y equal to 5x we chose six original points six stages in the original experiment we got six ordered pairs and then we plotted all of them and then connected them by the straight line then we can extend the line and then that was that line was the graph of our equation the question is do we really need six plotted points do we need to plot six points to get a straight line to get the graph for a linear equation so now the question is 
can we get that same straight line but instead of plotting six can we plot fewer points and still easily get the same straight line so what is the minimum number of points that we have to actually plot for a linear equation after which we can get the straight line and we don't have to sit and plot anymore all the other points of the experiment and of this equation will be on that straight line what is that minimum number of points that we have to plot so let's now try to find out what is that minimum number of points that we need to plot before which we can get that straight line for an equation like what we have here y equal to 5x and whatever we discover here it can then be extended to any other similar linear equation so we can just use this as an example now if you look at all the plotted points that we've used for this particular equation the first point was 0 comma 0 or the origin so let's start from there you can choose any point i'm just choosing the first point just to make it simple so now is it enough for us to just plot 0 comma 0 if we just plot 0 comma 0 like i have shown here is that enough from that can i actually get the specific straight line which is the graph for this equation y equal to 5x let's see if that's possible so i've shown that diagram over here this point over here is 0 comma 0 now you can actually easily visualize this you can imagine this right if you start at 0 comma 0 to get a straight line what do we need we have to move only in one direction then the shape that we get is a straight line but if you start at 0 comma 0 and you only plot that one point and as you can see from the diagram you can start from this point and you can go straight like this that's one straight line you can go like this that's another straight line you can go like this that's another straight line so as long as you don't change your direction you can go in this direction that direction that direction that direction you can actually go in an infinite number of directions to keep the diagram clean i have just shown you a few but from this you can extend it in your head right you can go in an infinite number of directions each of them will be a straight line and each of them start from 0 comma 0 so if you have just a single point the number of straight lines that a single point is a part of is actually infinite so we can call this a family of lines a family means a group it's a bunch right all of them have this point 0 comma 0 so it's an entire family in this case that family is made up of an infinite number of lines right and only one of those infinite lines is the line that we are looking for is the line which is the graph of our equation y equal to 5x among this clutter among this family we need to isolate and pinpoint or narrow down to one member right but just by having a single point we are not able to do that we cannot narrow down from all these infinite members of the family to one right now if you see the lines are making a sort of a chakra like a wheel right now out of all these different spokes out of all these different lines in the chakra which is that one line that we are looking for just with one point it's not enough right so one point is not enough to get the graph of a linear equation let's now try two points so to see if two points are enough to be plotted to get the straight line that shows our equation y equal to 5x i've taken the second point now now i have particularly chosen the second plotted point that we have originally used so first one being 0 comma 0 the second one being 1 comma 5 there's no compulsion on which points you choose if you want to choose some other point that's also fine among these plotted points if you want to take a new point get the x and y values and take a completely different point in the experiment using the equation and compare that with 0 comma 0 that's up to you which two points you take from the equation from the experiment it's completely up to you just to keep it simple i'm taking the very next plotted point the question now that we are asking is if i just plot 0 comma 0 and if i plot 1 comma 5 will those two points be enough to give me the straight line that i am looking for which is the straight line that shows the graph of this equation y equal to 5x are these two points enough right so let's see I have put those points over here a 0 comma 0 b 1 comma 5 now one thing you have to keep in mind is that 0 comma 0 and 1 comma 5 they are not some random points right they are points from the experiment they are points whose x and y values have come from the equation so whatever that straight line that we want which is the graph of this equation y equal to 5x it must have 0 comma 0 and 1 comma 5 the question is is it enough to plot just these two points to get that straight line or do we have to plot more let's see what the situation is 
now if i start from a 0 comma 0 right now if i have to get a straight line what do we know about a straight line straight line will only come if when you start from a point you keep traveling only in one direction the moment you change the direction the moment you change the angle you will no longer have a straight line you will start getting two different straight lines or you start getting a curve whatever right? whenever you change direction straight line is gone right so if i have to get a straight line from a 0 comma 0 i have to keep moving in one direction now I have to not only move in one direction to get a straight line, I want that straight line to also have B, right? So now I can't move in any random direction. That one direction that I start moving and don't change, that has to be the direction that takes me from A to B. Now B is location is fixed. B is not a moving point. B is 1,5. So if I have to start from A, and move in one and only one direction and get to B, I have to just move in that direction that takes me towards B. I can't move in any other direction, right? And since B's location is fixed, that one direction that I have to move from A has to be that same direction that takes me towards B. You cannot go in any other direction. That will be along this straight line that we have shown here. I've shown it with the arrow starting from A, gone to B and if you want you can extend that on this side you can extend this on this side right so this straight line represents the path that you have to take if you have to go from A maintain the same direction so that the line is straight and also hit B this way you get both the conditions you now have a straight line because you haven't changed the, the, the direction and since you've chosen a particular direction that allows you to hit B the straight line is not only straight, it also has A and B on it, right? If you had chosen another random direction, you would have gotten a straight line, but you won't have B. That's what I have shown over here, right? Here, I'm getting a straight line. If you see this dotted line, I'm getting a straight line, but the direction I have chosen takes me somewhere else. It's never going to hit B. So this line, while it's straight, it doesn't hit B. So it's not what we want. One of the conditions are gone, right? Now the question is, now this is a good line. This is a straight line, that's great because it is a straight line, this one. This is a straight line and it has A and B, which is what we want. The question is, is this the line that we want? Is this the graph of the equation y equal to 5x or is there any other way in which we can get something just like this? Is there any other straight line which is straight and as well as has points A and B. Now, if you can see this diagram, it's clear that there actually is no other way to get that. Because as you saw here, if I move in one direction, straight line, but no point B, right? Look at this attempt here. I have moved in one direction, so straight line, but no point B. But if I have to get the point B, what do I do? From here, I have to now move in another direction. So I'll get another straight line and then I will hit B. So I have this path like this, right? Now, if I follow this path, I'm hitting B. But the problem is what? The first condition is gone because you have gone like this and then change the direction. This is one straight line and this is a different straight line. One straight line and a different straight line. So now you have A and B. If you look at this figure, you have A and B. They're touching, they've been connected, but through two different straight lines, different directions. It's not one straight line. So again, one condition is gone, right? In this one, we had the straight line, but didn't have B. In this one, we have A and B, but it's not a straight line, right? If you want to get both, that is a straight line, and have A and B, you have to start from A, go in one direction, but that one direction has to be the direction that takes you towards B and B alone. And the only way that's possible is this. As we've seen, if you try anything else, one of the two conditions are gone, right? And that's not what we want. So therefore, if you're seeing what's happening over here, we are realizing something quite spectacular. We are realizing that if we have to get a straight line, right? One point is not enough, but once I get a second point, once I have two points, two chosen points, there is only one straight line that can be drawn connecting those two points that you have chosen. Any two points in space, if you choose, there is only one way to connect them with a straight line. 
There are infinite ways to connect them. That's why I've shown these other curves, right? If you look at these two other curves, they're just curves, right? There are many ways to connect A and B. That way I can start from A and do one full snake along the board like this and come to B, right? Just like these curves, just like these two sets of straight lines, you know, like this and like that. I can connect them in infinite ways. But among all those infinite ways to connect A and B or any two points in space with a straight line, there is only one such line that is possible and then you can extend it, right? So what we've done here, if you compare where we started off, it's a beautiful process of narrowing down into the option that you want from a larger pool, right? Because if you see what we did over here, when we had one point, from a single point, there are many straight lines possible. We got an infinite family. In that family, we wanted to isolate only one member, the straight line that we want, right? Then what did we do? We wanted to find out a straight line which has these two points that we have chosen. And then we realized that when you put it here, only this line is possible. No other straight line is possible to connect A and B. So if you compare from this family, all the other options get eliminated. All the other straight lines in your chakra are now eliminated by the next condition because you have put point B. Until I put point B in the picture, all the lines were possible from the origin. The moment I put point B, all the others got eliminated. Only one possible straight line was left, which was able to connect A and B and also be a straight line. That became this. So this straight line that you're seeing connecting A and B is one member, just one member of this entire family. It's a very similar process to the concept of address, right? Which is basically used in your GPS navigation, etc. right? Supposing for example, you say Bangalore city, I live in Bangalore. Now when you say I live in Bangalore, there are a whole host of options as to where you live in Bangalore because Bangalore is a huge set. It's a big city. That's kind of like this, right? It's a big city. Then if you add a little more information, you say, okay, I live in this particular neighborhood, neighborhood A, just for the sake of simplicity, neighborhood name is A. The moment you say neighborhood A, all the other neighborhoods are gone, right? So it's eliminated and now you are narrowed down your focus. But again, within A, within that neighborhood A, there are many streets, many houses, right? you still need to get a little bit more specific. You need more information. Then within that neighborhood, you say, I live in this street and this cross, right? Then once that happens, all the other streets in the neighborhood are eliminated. Now you're pinpointing. Now you're getting more focused towards the answer you want. You get to the street. Within that street, you can specify the house number. All the other houses go. Within that house, you can specify the floor. Within the floor, you can specify a bedroom. Within the bedroom, you can specify who's sitting on that couch and then you can find out your friend, right? That's similar to what we have done over here. Started from a larger pool and as we add more conditions, we see that the entities or the members of the family which don't fit that condition are eliminated and what's left will take you closer to your answer. In this case, it looks like we're getting the answer in just one step. So now we can clearly see a very important mathematical result, right? That if you have two points in space, there are infinite ways to connect them, but there is only one unique straight line that you can draw to connect any two points in space. That is this line in this particular case, A to B, and I've extended it here, and this is the line. Now the question is, is this straight line also the graph of the equation y equal to 5x, which means all the other stages in this experiment which obey this equation, all the other stages in the experiment, will they now be on this line? Now, by looking at how we've discovered things so far, it seems to be quite clear. The answer is slapping us in the face, but as is the theme with this course, let's do it in a step-by-step -step way and see the answer in front of our eyes beyond any doubt, right? Now, let's look at our equation again. Now we know from our entire study that this equation is in the form of a linear equation. Equations which are in this form, whatever their graph is, that graph has to be a straight line. Hence, we use the word linear. So whatever graph this equation has, whatever graph this equation has, that graph is a straight line. That's the first point. The second point is where everything comes together. That straight line graph, which is the graph of this equation which we're looking for, that straight line 
wherever it is, however it looks, that line has to have points A and B for sure. Why? Because points A and B come from the original experiment. Points A and B obey the equation y equal to 5x. Since points A and B obey the equation y equal to 5x, obviously those points must be there on the graph of the equation y equal to 5x. Whatever straight line is the graph of the equation y equal to 5x, every point on that straight line obeys the equation y equal to 5x. That's why we call it the graph of the equation, right? So if every point has to obey, points A and B do obey. Points A and B come from this experiment. They come from this equation. So whatever line, whatever straight line we're looking for, that straight line graph has to, has to have points A and B. This is where the answer becomes very clear. We are looking for a straight line which has to have points A and B. And now we know from our earlier investigation that there is only one possible straight line that I can draw which has points A and B. So now you put these two things together, you put these two requirements together and there is no other option. If I want a straight line graph because that's what I will get for an equation like this and that straight line graph has to have points A and B and we know that there is only one such straight line I can draw to join to have points A and B. Therefore, this line that I have now drawn, which is that one line which has A and B, it has to be the graph of this equation y equal to 5x, which means all the other points the plotted points earlier and all the other stages in the experiment, all of which satisfy the equation y equal to 5x, they will all be on this line. And therefore, this line is in fact this line that we originally plotted. Two points are now sufficient to get the straight line which shows you the graph of a linear equation. Right? This is a very useful discovery because now going forward, tomorrow when I see an equation which is in this form, a linear equation, dependent variable equal to some constant into some independent variable. It's great news for me because in that situation, I don't have to plot three, four, five, six points. I know the graph is a straight line. I can just take any two points, any two stages which obey this equation, put them on the Cartesian plane, join them by that one straight line which is the only line that's possible to connect those two points, extend the line and I can rest assured that all the other points will be on that straight line. Now, keep in mind, this is not something that we could have done in the beginning, right? When we first started with the experiment, we did not have enough knowledge to just put two points and join them and say confidently that that line would be the graph of this equation. Why? Because when we first started the experiment, we had no idea that an equation like this will give us a straight line graph. We had no idea how the graph is going to look. At that stage, we had to take five, six points. We had to plot them. We had to see how, what shape they were forming. Then we had to do Hansel and Gretel. Then we had to see why they were forming a straight line, get into rate of change, etc., and then do the abstraction. And then see, ha, ah, yes, the pattern is forming. That whenever I have an equation in this form, because of everything that happens in terms of rates of change, etc the graph will be a straight line so the earlier time we had to do all the hard work so that we get the knowledge we're able to see the pattern right that equations in this form are linear equations they give you straight line graphs right at that stage we did not know all of that so we had to plot the six points thanks to that effort and then looking back and seeing the pattern, now we can going forward, we don't have to repeat this entire procedure because we have seen the patterns. We have seen the patterns. So tomorrow when I'm doing any experiment and we'll be doing many of them in the physics courses and the chem and the bio courses as well. When we do an experiment and we get an equation in this form, thanks to the work that we have done here, then we don't have to plot five, six points. Thanks to this work, building on this work, when I see an equation like this, I will just plot two points because I know that the graph is a straight line. Plot two points, extend the line, and that line will be the graph of this equation. So now we have a beautiful conclusion, right? For any linear equation, for any linear equation, if you have to get its graph because the graph is a straight line, just plot two points which satisfy the equation connect them, extend it, and that straight line is the graph of that equation. Now for some 
terminology, also throwing some light on the way in which we write information about graph plotting. This is important specifically for students when they are doing their lab reports, etc. Sometimes they get confused with the instruction while plotting a graph, specifically in terms of which quantity do I plot on the x-axis and which quantity do we plot on the y-axis. So this is based on a certain agreed upon convention. So that all the people in the world, the scientists, everyone get together and we say, okay, how do we write what to plot versus what? When we write in our laboratory reports and instructions and everything, this is just some nomenclature on that. In general, we write it like this. Whichever quantity we want to plot on the y-axis, we write that quantity first. Then we use the word versus. Versus means against or with, right? You're comparing one quantity with the other, right? So the quantity that needs to be plotted on the y-axis is written first. Then we say versus. Then we write the quantity to be plotted on the x-axis. Now, there are sometimes some exceptions to this, but in general, this is the thing that we have agreed upon. That's all. There's no major mathematical scientific explanation for this. This is generally something that we have agreed upon. So the quantity to be plotted on the y-axis first versus the quantity to be plotted on the x-axis. So here, for example, distance is plotted on the y-axis. So that's written first, distance versus time in this case along the x-axis. So that's written next. I have shown that over here. So whenever you see distance versus time in your head, you must know that distance is to be put on the y-axis, the first quantity. After the word versus time in this case, that will be put along the x-axis. So in other words, basically when you have something versus something else in your head as a student, it must tell you to do it as y-axis versus x-axis. So whatever is here on the y-axis, whatever is here on the x-axis. Now, in general, what that means is, and what convention we follow is whatever quantity we put on the y-axis in general, that is the dependent variable. Okay. And whatever quantity we put on the x-axis in general, it is the independent variable. So this is just a general rule. There are some times where there may be exceptions. In general, we follow this sort of a system so that there's no confusion. When we say plot a graph of quantity A versus quantity B, in most cases, that means A is the dependent variable versus B is the independent variable. And the format is always when you see A versus B, that is dependent variable versus independent variable, it is in the format y-axis versus x-axis. So the dependent variable, the first term A is on the y-axis. The independent variable, the second term B is on the x-axis. This is a general agreement that we have when we plot graphs. So based on that, this particular graph, this is another way of writing it sometimes, we'll say plot the distance time graph for this car. So when we say plot the distance time graph, always remember first quantity y-axis, second quantity x-axis. This is just something that we've agreed upon, that's all. So distance versus time. If you want to plot time versus distance, you can accordingly when you read the graph for your answers, you have to know what you have put on the x-axis and what you have put on the y-axis. It's just so that we all speak the same language, we follow this sort of a system. That's about it. Another important and often used term is a word called locus, right? Now, locus in simple terms means the path that is followed by any object or in any experiment, the actual path that something takes, right? The journey, the shape of the path, that the formal word for that is locus. Now again, we're giving the importance to words like this because when you do higher mathematics, higher engineering, etc., you have subjects like control systems and stuff like that where the usage of the word locus is quite common. So this is just to get you familiar with it. It's nothing fancy, it essentially means path. Now, how does that apply over here? It's just, you can use the word locus to say the same thing in a slightly different way. What do we say so far? We say that for the equation y equal to 5x, the graph of this equation is this straight line, right? We know that. Another way of saying that is, if you take 
all the points that obey this equation that is x coordinate 5 times y coordinate x coordinate multiplied by 5 get the y coordinate if you plot one by one all the points which satisfy this equation if you plot them one by one and if you join those points all the points which fit this equation the path that you will get the shape of the path that you will get is this straight line and the fancy word for path is locus so instead of saying the graph of this equation y equal to 5x is this straight line another way of saying that is on the cartesian plane the locus the locus that is the path that is formed when you connect all the points for whom the y coordinate is 5 times the x coordinate or the locus of all the points which obey the equation y equal to 5x that locus or that path is this straight line so it's just a different way of saying the same thing this word locus comes quite often so it's good to be aware of what it essentially means in its simplest form it simply means path As we bring this entire lesson to a close, I'd just like to finish up by discussing a couple of things which are often overlooked in most uh, preliminary science and math courses. And even if some attention is given to them, it's kind of done very quickly and it can lead to some confusion for students. It certainly confused me for a very long time and I had to actually sit and piece it out and figure it out slowly step by step so that's why in that spirit i want to just throw some light on it i will be doing a detailed sort of study of this particular aspect of of the sciences in the physics course which will help all the other sciences as well that will be coming up very soon so this is just a mini treatment of that larger idea and what i'm talking about is two important aspects the idea of a unit of measurement like for example meter centimeter second for time etc right units for measurement and the idea of mathematical formulae where do mathematical formulae come from so these two aspects i often find that students are a bit confused they've done it they've studied it but when it actually comes to understanding where this stuff comes from and how does this actually connect to real life I find that uh, a lot of students are confused and I can completely understand that because I was confused as well. So what I want to do here is point out the sources of, those con of that confusion and see if in a small way at least we can understand the basic idea which will be sufficient for the mathematics course for now and a detailed discovery into all of this will be done in the physics program as well. Now the two aspects are the concept of the unit, where does the idea of unit come from, what does the word unit really mean, unit of measurement and the second thing is the idea of a formula right? or a mathematical relationship, where do mathematical formulae, scientific formulae, where do they come from, how do they connect to real life. So we'll start with the second first actually and then we'll do a small mini dive into units as well by the end of this lesson. The first thing is to do with mathematical formulae and I want to use our example because one important aspect we used in this experiment is the concept of speed right and let's use speed as a tool to take a slight deep dive into the idea of mathematical formulae in general now we know by now we know that speed is equal to distance by time the question now is why is speed equal to distance by time so let's take a step back into the quantities that make up this quantity speed right speed is made up of distance and time and let's look at them a little bit more now distance, if you just think about real life, distance is the actual length between one point and another point, right? So when you look at distance, it is a real quantity. You can check and test and see distance in real life. Distance is not something that we've made up, right? It is there in real life. You can see, okay, there is a car here and there is a person there and there is some gap between the car and the person and if you have to go to the person the car has to move if the person has to come to the car the person has to move or both have to move there is some real aspect to the quantity distance right in other words like exactly what we said car and the person car moves person moves you can conduct some actual experiment 
right you can actually see it in real life through experiment through your actual experience of life that there is something called distance now maybe you measure that distance in a way of your choosing you want to measure it in meter you want to measure it in kilometers you want to measure it by how many slippers it takes you take your own slipper and stack them one by one and you say okay it takes totally 10 slippers to go from here to here how you measure it is up to you right but there is something real there right so distance is a real quantity it exists in the universe right it's not something that we have come up with right similarly time now time is a little bit tricky because unlike distance you can't see time like you can't hold time in your hand and say this is time but if you've seen how life goes from your day-to-day -day experience of life you can feel that there is something like time of course when you do higher physics things like distance and time will start to bend and they'll start to warp and i'm really excited to show you how that is also real and in the physics course as we go along once we hit einstein stuff it becomes pretty fascinating but at least in the current domain in our current experience of life what from a physics point of view we refer to as the newtonian domain the classical physics domain distance and time are pretty pretty standard right so if you think of time now unlike distance as we said you can't maybe hold it and say this is time but just from your day-to-day -day experience of life you know that there is something called time you can feel it right because for example all the events in your life right eating sleeping going to work studying all of them don't happen together they happen in some sort of a sequence now you're eating then something happens then you may sleep then you may go to work then you may go to play and then again you eat then again you sleep and this kind of repeats right and we've given names to these cycles we, we can call them days we can call them weeks months years decades right so in some kind of a cycle events are happening one after the other because of which we get the feeling that there is something called time so while it's a little tricky you can't directly see it it's definitely real and then we can come up with experiments you know by to track how long an event takes based on how many swings of a pendulum how many ticks of a clock we can make measurements using devices so in some way again like distance time is a real quantity it's there in the universe and you can actually measure it and test it through real experiments right so distance and time are in math in physics we refer to them as fundamental quantities they are there in the universe right and that's our starting point it's part of real life but now we'll come to speed right now i want you to think about this because this might seem a little bit weird up front if you think about it if you just look at the universe if you look at existence around you there is no quantity like speed right and it's certainly not written anywhere in the universe that speed is equal to distance by time right there's nothing like that what is there is yes you can have a car which is going really slowly right you can have a car which is going really fast right you can have a car which is not going at all that is there but what is not there in the universe is the idea that speed that is a way to measure how fast this car is going or whether it's going at all the way to do that is to divide distance by time that instruction is not there and there's no reason for that instruction to be there right whether you choose to divide distance by time or whether you choose to do the square of distance divided by time whether you choose to do time divided by distance and call that speed those are all human decisions we define it we come up with it we fix it like that when a car is moving on the straight road whether you decide to call speed distance square by time whether you decide to call it time by distance those are all things you're writing on a piece of paper it does not at all change the movement of the car right so whether you define speed in this way or whether you define speed to be another equation what is actually happening in the universe doesn't change whatever is going in a certain with a certain amount of fastness it will be going if the car is going to go faster it will go faster if the car wants to stop it will stop the universe real life doesn't change one bit based on how you decide to write a formula for speed in your paper right so the question is why do we define speed like this there is something called fastness right in the real world some things go faster some things go slower that is there that is real right and when i say faster and slow what is real 
Distance and time is what is real. If, a, if an object is going faster, that means what? In a certain amount of time, it covers more distance. The time and the distance, that is real. If an object is going slower, what does that mean? It means in a certain amount of time, it is not covering that much distance, right? So from that perspective, yes, there is something real. But the decision, in order to get an idea, in order to measure and understand what will be the best way to measure this fastness, to measure the speed of a car or of an object, the decision to do that by saying speed is distance divided by time, the decision to divide the distance traveled by the time elapsed, that is a human decision. There is no rule. There is no rule, there is no proof, there is no experiment that one can do to prove why speed is equal to distance by time. No, this is a definition. This is a human definition, something that we define in order to make sense, in order to better understand the real world. It is connected to the real world because it's connected to the real quantity distance. It is connected to the real quantity time. But the decision to divide the distance by time and not divide the distance square by time or not divide the time by the distance, that is a human decision. And we can see the merit in that decision, right? If you divide distance by time, it's a good idea because, okay, so much distance is there, so much time is there. When we divide the distance by time, we'll get an idea of how that distance is shared over time. And if the car is faster, that number will be higher, obviously. If the car is slower, that number will be lower. So when we define it like this, it does help us understand how fast or slow the car is moving. And we'll do that very soon in great detail here. So we can see why we define it like that, right? So it's connected to real life. It helps us understand real life. By defining it like this, it does give us a clear picture of when the car is moving faster and when the car is moving slower. So it works, right? But there is no experimental proof. There is no natural reason just by looking at the existence around you that will show you clearly why speed has to be distance by time. This is something we define. So you want to summarize this. Distance is real. Time is real. But the decision to combine distance and time in this particular way and call that speed that is defined, that is our definition. There is no mathematical or experimental proof that I can give you or anyone can give you. And actually it's not needed, right? To show, to prove that speed is equal to distance by time. This does not need proof because this is like how when somebody names you, when you're born, people give you a name, right? So as long as they don't change that name from your passport, from your driver's license, etc., then everybody can use that same name for whenever they call you. There's no confusion, right? But there is no mathematical reason or there's no proof for why your name is what your name is, right? This is kind of similar to that, okay? So we define it as distance by time and we can see the use of that because there is something real in the universe when you're talking about something going faster and something going slower. What is not real, what is not a must is to define that speed as distance by time. You can define it in whatever way you want. But by defining it as distance by time, it is useful because when you define distance by time as a speed, this number does become a good indicator of how fast that car is going. Because if the car is going faster, this number will be higher. If the car is going slower, this number will be lower. So it works. That's why we define it. But that doesn't mean to change the fact that it is a defined quantity. It is not something that we discover from an experiment, right? There is no such thing as distance by time in the universe. There is distance. There is time. But distance by time is not there in the universe. There is fastness and slowness. There are things that go faster and there are things that go slower. But the decision to measure that fastness or slowness by doing distance by time, that is our decision. So speed is a defined quantity. Now, this is a mini part of a larger treatment that we do in the physics course where we divide, we categorize all mathematical formulae and physical formulae, scientific formulae into three categories and see the purposes of all of them, right? This is one of the categories I've introduced you to here, defined. And the two others, we won't get into too much detail right now, but you can understand them if you just hear the words themselves. The two others are discovered. Discovered are those formulae which when you do experiments, you see that this quantity in the universe is linked to that quantity 
because that's how the universe is that's how the existence is that's how our existence works right so whether you like it or not that is the relationship right and the experiment will help you discover that relationship so those are called discovered equations discovered formulae we can't change anything like anything about them that's how they are right so defined is one discovered is one more and the third is you for the e equations that we define and for the equations that we have discovered we can rearrange them mathematically you know by cross multiplying etc and we can put those same equations in a different form in order to make our calculations easier we call them derived right derived so broadly three the tri triple d basically d d d right defined discovered and derived and in the physics class we'll do a detailed you know exposition taking examples and experiments and everything and to kind of see clearly the difference between the three types of formulae so here it's important to understand that distance and time are real speed defined as distance by time is exactly that it's defined right there's no mathematical proof for it but it works it helps us measure how fast or slow something is and that's why we stick to it that's very important so speed is a defined formula Now we can see how that formula actually plays out, right? This is like a more, you know, ground up way of showing you how we define speed, right? So we have an experiment like this, which is basically our car starting from the zero mark and moving on the straight road. This is just a mini diagram of this, right? And what data do we have? So we might see that it travels a total of 10 meter, right? In a total time of two seconds. So when you have a situation like this, a car, which is traveling 10 meter in two seconds, these quantities are a little bit disconnected. Okay, 10 meter in two seconds, right? But we want to get an idea. We want to get an idea of how fast this car is going. Because of what we want, right? How fast the car is going, we now have some reason to divide the distance by time. Because when we say speed is equal to distance by time, why do we say d by t? Because when we say d by t, what are we doing? Think back to what the meaning of division is, right? You have 10 meter and you have 2 seconds. So the 10 meter is being covered over a period of 2 seconds, right? So you can think of the 2 seconds as 2 boxes, right? One box is 1 second, the other box is another second. So you have one box of time and another box of time. And you can think of the 10 meters as like, kind of like 10 chocolates, right? So if you have 10 chocolates and you have two boxes, an easy way to understand how this 10 meter is, or oh sorry, in this case chocolates, how these 10 chocolates are spread across these two boxes is you can share them, right? You can split these 10 chocolates over the two boxes. So we do the process of division, right? So we do 10 chocolates divided by two boxes. So a good way of understanding it is five chocolates in the first box, five chocolates in the second box. In other words, five chocolates per box. And that calculation we've got by doing 10 divided by two. Something very similar here. If I, if I do that calculation, division of the distance by time, it will give me a good idea of how fast this car is going. Because if this car goes 10 meter, in two seconds, if you think of those two seconds as boxes of time, one second and one second, and the total is 10 meters. If I want to share, right, the 10 meter, how is it spread out? How is it shared across those two seconds? If you do 10 meter divided by the two seconds, you're like the chocolates and the boxes, you are sharing this 10 meter over a time of two seconds, which means when you do the division 10 by two, what you're doing is just like the chocolates and the boxes, you're saying, okay, that means how fast this car is going. This car is going so fast such that you can think of it as five meters in the first box of time, that is in the first second, and five meters in the second box of time, that is the second second, right? Five meter first second, five meters in the second. So five meter plus five meter, 10 meter, one second plus one second, two second. So the idea of division will now give me a good indicator of how fast this car is going. Okay, 10 meters and two seconds, that means Every one second, you can think that it's going five meters. Okay, that's how fast the car is going. Every one second, it's covering five meters. So how did I get this information of one second, five meters? By dividing the total distance by total time. Because we know that division, 
what does it do it tells you how much of the numerator is there for every one of the denominator right that's what we're doing over here 10 meter divided by 2 seconds in the simplest form i've shown the cancellation here 1 2s are 2 5 2s are 10 simplifying 10 by 2 division right that is 5 meters divided by 1 second in simplest form what does that mean in english it just means 5 meter per second so now we can see the benefits of defining speed like this right when I define speed like this I'm dividing the total distance by the total time when I divide the total distance by the total time it gives me a good idea of how much distance is travel for every unit of passing time how many meters per second and that is good to call that speed that's a human decision it's good to call that speed because that number does give you a good idea of how, of how fast the car was going if that number was 30 right that means in the same one second it's traveling 30 meters that's a much faster car right so this definition works it helps us understand how fast the car is going and therefore it's good to have speed as defined as speed is equal to distance by time that's what we've shown in the diagram here 10 meters two seconds you can break that up as five meters per second five meter one second five meter one second so now we can see the benefits Right? with a mathematical example of defining speed as distance divided by the time. This next calculation we've actually seen a couple of times before in the course of these last few lessons, but I just want to repeat it with the context of understanding how to handle what we refer to as the units of any physical quantity like for example the unit of length being meter and the unit of time being second we will do a deep dive in, in, in the physics lessons but this is just to handle units because I want to draw attention to certain things we do when we handle units in algebraic calculations that we sort of just do as a habit but we don't really know why we're doing it. And because of that, it gets us into trouble when we do higher, more advanced calculations because we don't know whether we should do something or we shouldn't do something, right? So any mathematical step that you do in any kind of calculation, you have to understand why you're doing it. In other words, you have to understand what it actually means in real life. Then you'll know why you're doing it, right? And this is good advice for life in general you know it, it has to make sense in real life you have to know why you're doing it with respect to what's happening actually so in that spirit we'll just look at the units how, how we handle it here now we know that we've defined speed as distance by time i know i can write it as five meter per second for our car i'm just writing it in a more expanded form of 10 meter divided by two seconds this essentially shows you where the five meter per second came from right we measure 10 meter over two seconds then we divided it and we realize it's five meter for every second i just want to use it in this form so that i can make a few important points with regard to when we do our mathematical calculations why we do what we do in those steps now one of the utilities of measuring speed or, and defining speed in this way as we've seen in lesson one itself is if i know the speed it's like kind of like knowing the price of one pen in a shop right the speed is kind of like that how much meter per second how many rupees per pen right if you go to a shop and you know the price for one pen then based on how many ever pens you want to buy all you have to do is a simple multiplication right and that's essentially what we can use for speed right because now if i know the speed is five meter for every second if you have a situation saying okay if the car maintains the speed right and covers five meter for every second five meter per second if you now have a time of 10 seconds being passed right so the total time t is 10 second we can use this definition of speed and our information of 10 second to find out in this 10 second how many how much distance the car has traveled what is the d right and what's the logic over there before you do any calculation you must understand why you do that calculation right now if i want to find the distance this is exactly like 10 rupees per pen and you have to buy 10 pens right so how do you find the total amount of money same thing that we do over here and what is that well for every one second it travels five meters right now we have how many such seconds 10 seconds that is one two three four five so on and so forth up till 10 we have 10 individual seconds and each second the car travels 
5 meters. So what will be the total distance the car travels after 10 seconds? You have to take this 5 and add it one time for each second. For the first second, 5. Then 5. Then 5. Then 5. So in other words, you have to add 5 how many times? 10 times. 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5. One time you take it for every second, right? 5, 5, 5. First, second, second, third, fourth. You keep adding it. So you add 5 10 times. And a short way of saying add something 10 times is we use the term multiplication. Multiplication is just a fancy way of saying addition, right? So adding 5 10 times is basically the short way of saying it is multiply 5 by 10. So when you say 5 into 10, what that actually means, multiplication is what we call it, but what it actually means is it's a shortcut of addition, right? It's 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5. You are taking 5 every time for every second. Since you have 10 such seconds, 10 such boxes of time, you take the 5 10 times. So what you do is 5 into 10, right? And what is this 5? What is it that you're adding 10 times? You're adding 5. What is that 5? The speed, right? And why 10? 10 is the number of seconds, right? You're adding it 10 times, but why 10? Because 10 is the number of such seconds, right? Each second, 5 meters. So this 10 is actually this. So when you do 5 into 10 to get the distance, the calculation you're actually doing is, if you, now if you plug in the units, you're doing 5, which is the speed, 5 meter per second. That's what the 5 actually is. And what is the 10? The 10 is this 10 seconds, right? So if you want to say the same calculation and now add the information of the units, D is equal to 5 meter per second into 10 seconds. This is very important because now we'll understand how the same story can also be told and can com be completely understood once you put the unit information as well and how to handle those units in a calculation and why we handle it the way we do. So. 5 into 10 now becomes 5 meter per second into 10 seconds because that's what it is. This 5 is this. This 10 is this, right? So this is the calculation. To make the calculation easier and to show the steps of what we do when we do these calculations, instead of writing it as 5 meter per second, I have written it as 10 meter divided by 2 seconds and you will see why very soon. So the calculation, when you actually do the problem, when you actually do the problem, instead of telling this whole story, the calculation that you will actually do. Once you understand the story, you will go straight to the calculation step, right? Because you know that this is the story where it comes from. So you don't have to tell yourself the story every time, right? The calculation you'll end up with is this. You'll be doing something like this. D is equal to 10 meter by two seconds, which is basically the speed, right? Into the time that you want, right? 10 seconds. So this is the formula. Distance is equal to speed into time. It's just the rearrangement of the speed formula, right? Now we are here. Now, when you, when you have a mathematical problem like this, right, and you're, you have a situation like this and you want to simplify this and get the final distance, because you're getting distance, the final unit has to obviously be meter, right? But how do you exactly do the calculation here? How do you handle the units and why do you do those steps? Right? And how do those steps connect to real life? That is very important to understand because otherwise you end up just blindly doing some calculation, right? some algebra, and you don't know how that links to real life. You don't know why you're doing it. This is always a sign of trouble. So let's complete this calculation. And again, let's take it step by step and at every step understand why we do what we do and how that shows us what's happening in real life. right? So. Now we have the distance d is equal to, it's essentially speed into time. I've shown the speed in a more, in a simpler way as 10 meter divided by two seconds. That's the speed into 10 seconds. So what's happening over here? First, we can obviously simplify the 10 meter divided by two seconds. Instead of saying 10 meter divided by two, 10 by two in a simpler form is actually just five by one. This is something we spoke of earlier called equivalent fractions, right? So you can simplify that one twos are two, five twos are 10. So instead of saying 10 by two, we can also say five meter divided by one second, which is basically your five meter per second. It's the speed. I'm just writing it in a slightly bigger way, right? So five meter divided by one second. So this simplifies to this. I have left the 10 second as it is, right? Now, this is where most students will do one thing because, and it's not wrong obviously, because that's what you've been taught, but sometimes you don't know why you're doing it. That's where the problem comes. The next step that most students will do is they'll see the second here, the unit of time, and they'll see the second here, the unit of time. This second is on top, the numerator. 
this second is down the denominator so the next immediate step is they will cancel this second and this second which I have done here I have done it in a slightly different way I'll come to that but what most students will do they will skip all of this they won't write this in all this different way they will just say second cancel off with this second right and they will straight away go to this step 5 meter into 10 and they will give you the answer as 50 meter the answer is right there is nothing wrong but one often overlooked step is why do we just cancel the units like this right and this is something that to some of us might seem quite obvious and be like, what's the problem here if you know why you're doing it that's fantastic for the longest time I was also doing it right and then at some point I realized I don't really know why I'm doing it and that came because when I did higher mathematics I got into trouble right because I did certain things with in certain equations which were not correct and I didn't understand why and I realized that it stemmed back it came all the way back to calculations like this and I actually didn't understand why I was doing it here as well and that got me into trouble and I found that many students have this problem which is an understandable problem to have you can see why because some of these steps if you don't understand from real life why you're doing it it may not make sense right it didn't make for me so I want to throw some light on that so we won't immediately just cancel we'll resist the temptation we'll see what's happening what do we want that makes us cancel it right let's see now in order to do that we will just rewrite this in a way I'm not changing anything 5 meter divided by 1 second into 10 seconds Without changing the meaning, I can write it like this. 5 meter into 10 second by 1 second. This 1 second is just a common denominator to both these terms, right? This basic algebra, right? So I have not changed anything. 5 meter into 10 second by 1 second. The reason I've written it like this is because now I can just focus on this term. 10 second by 1 second. See, what do we want actually? We want what is the total distance traveled by the car after 10 seconds and we know from the story that we told earlier how do we get that well every one second it travels 5 meters so 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 5 into 10 that is the calculation right I'm going to tell that same story that same story through the actual equation so that story is again very clear right so that it's not one separate story and one separate calculation that story of adding 5 10 times can also be seen through the calculation for showing that I have written it in this form 5 meter into 10 second by 1 second now I want you to focus on this just focus on this term 10 second by 1 second I know I have cancelled out the s here assuming that we have not done it yet you will see why you can do it right so right now in the beginning these the the cancel mark that you're seeing assume it's not there it's just 10 second by 1 second okay 10 second by 1 second what does it actually mean what does 10 second by 1 second mean think of division right on the numerator you have 10 seconds and the denominator you have one second so if I have a total time of 10 seconds and I'm dividing that by the number one second in English what does that mean it means you have a total time of 10 seconds and what do you do what do you mean when you say 10 second by one second you mean for a time of 10 seconds if I was to divide or split or break that total time of 10 seconds into slots into boxes or into groups of one second each right the total time of 10 seconds divide it divide it means break it up split it up split up this 10 second total time into small pieces where the size of each small piece is one second right if you do that how many such slices of one second will you get that is what 10 second by one second means right 10 seconds broken up into slices or into smaller sections of time right where each slice has a duration of one second so the question in English the question in English that this is trying to answer is how many slots right how many sections of one second each how many sections of one second each do I get in a total time of 10 and how many sections will that be one two three four five six seven eight nine ten the answer to this is ten the answer to this is not ten seconds right ten seconds is, a, is an amount of time ten seconds 
10 second divided by 1 second is not telling you the amount of time. It is telling you the number of pieces. The number of pieces that you can split the total time of 10 seconds where the length of each piece, the size of each piece is 1 second. Right? So each piece, the size is 1 second. The total time is 10 seconds. How many such pieces will be there? This 10 is the number of pieces. This 10 is the number of sections, each section being one second that you can fit in a total time of 10 seconds. So this 10 is not an amount of time. This 10 is not an amount of time. This 10 is the number of slices of one second each. So obviously it makes no sense to put the unit second there. It's not 10 seconds. It is 10 slices of one second each that you can put to fit a total time of 10 seconds. So this cannot have a unit. It cannot have the second unit over here. The unit second cannot be here. That doesn't make any sense. This is number of pieces. Right? Number of slices, each slice being one second. So this is a number of slice kind of a thing. right? So there are only 10 such pieces. right? Therefore, what does that mean? That means that when the, you do this calculation, the final answer should be 10. That means this second and this second should go, should be eliminated, should be removed. Therefore, because that is what you're doing in real life, this second and this second basically can be removed. Hence, now that we know the story, in future calculations, when we see something like this, we can straight away cancel because this is what we are doing. So first know what you're doing. Know why you're doing it. Then it's then you will only realize, yeah, okay, the short shorter way of saying that is cancel out the units because it's the same unit on top and the same unit down. But understand why you're doing it, right? And this ties in well with our entire story, right? Because when you divide 10 second by 1 second, you realize that the 10 second interval can be broken up into 10 pieces. Each piece is 1 second, right? And in each of those pieces, for each piece, each piece is 1 second and for that first piece, the distance traveled is 5 meters. For the second piece, again the time is 1 second. When 1 second elapses, the car travels 5 meters. The third piece is again 1 second. When 1 second elapses, the car travels 5 meters. Right? So how many ever pieces you have? You have 10 pieces. Each piece is 1 second. And for each of those pieces, the car travels 5 meters. So what will be the total distance traveled by the car? The total distance traveled by the car will be the 5 meter that it travels for a single piece because a single piece is 1 second and that single piece the car travels 5 meters. How many such pieces are there? How many such 1 second pieces are there? There are 10 such 1 second pieces. For each 1 second piece the car travels 5 meters. So what will be the total distance traveled by the car? Add that 5 meters how many times? How many ever pieces are there? So when you are doing 5 meter into 10, you are doing 5 meter plus 5 meter plus 5 meter. Why? We are doing, when you are doing that, you are adding the 5 meter for how many ever pieces of 1 second intervals. How many ever such pieces are there? There are 10 such pieces, right? 10 such slots of 1 second each. For each slot, 5 meters is traveled. So to get the total distance, you will take this 5 meters and add it how many times? How many ever pieces are there? So this 10 is not 10 seconds, right? This 10 is the number of pieces of 1 second each. Each piece, 5 meters is traveled. So 5 meters plus 5 meters plus 5 meters all the way 10 times. The short way of saying that is 5 meter into 10 not 5 meter into 10 seconds, right? 5 meter into 10 is 50 meter. This is why we do what we do. This is why when you have the same unit in the numerator and the same unit in the denominator, you can cancel, right? And this is a very important point. I, I know I've kind of, again, you know, <laughs> rammed it to the ground, but the reason I do this is because in my experience, I have dealt with students even grade 11 grade 12 ibhl math students and i don't blame them because this is something that's not looked at in great detail and when math becomes more complicated at higher levels this can trouble you it definitely troubled me i have had students come and ask me when they have 10 second by one second why is the answer not 10 second right another typical example when it comes to something called mass in physics right so supposing you have 10 kg divided by 2 kg, 
why is the answer 5 and not 5 kg right so this is a very common question it's not just a one off kind of a thing where one student has asked many students have asked across different backgrounds across different streams different schools right so that made me realize that there is something fundamental there is something underlying that's happening where the student is not able to connect this to what's actually happening in real life what is the actual story of the experiment from where all this calculation comes from because of that the student doesn't know why he's doing what he's doing and therefore sometimes he blindly cancels sometimes he doesn't cancel and the questions still remain when that happens he gets a little bit confused he or she and that automatically starts bringing the fear and the insecurity right so the student is completely justified right in feeling what they feel right because it is up to the teacher it's up to us to make sure that at every stage the connection with real life is not broken if that is not broken then every step that the student is doing he or she will understand why certain things are done why certain things are not done so this is a good way a good example of showing what's exactly happening using the same old car example why and when can we cancel units of measurement? That's a wrap for this lesson. In the next lesson and maybe the lesson after that, we're just going to build a little more on the ideas that we've discovered so far and develop some more important tools, some more important concepts. Now, I know that the lesson still now and possibly the next two as well will be like this a bit long, a bit intense and at times I know a bit repetitive, right? But the reason we're doing it like this is to ensure that these basic ideas right which sometimes are a little bit tricky to fully grasp you get a clear picture of what's happening and the reason is because once you have a good grasp of these basic ideas then slowly a few lessons after this very soon actually things are going to start getting a little weird but in an amazing way in a beautiful way that you can actually really appreciate what's actually happening in real life and the beauty and the elegance of what's happening in real life and how math can help make us understand that very clearly. Topics like differential and integral calculus, trigonometry, logarithms and topics of their ilk, right? And most of these words now when some of you are hearing them, it might fill you with a little bit of panic. But trust me, once you get a good grasp of these underlying ideas, you will really start to see that those other ideas that build on this are just continuations of this, right? It's just a continuation of this. They are funky, they are weird, they are crazy, but they are unbelievably beautiful, they are true and they are fun. I'll see you soon. Namaskaram.